Got 20 seconds. I'm on, man, to go. Keep moving, keep moving, keep moving. Good. Get those knees up. Explode. Good. Explode. Let's go. Up. Drive forward. Let's go. One more. Up. You are listening to the Fight Strength Podcast with your hosts, Bill DeRue and Jason Burgos. What is going on, fighting and fitness true believers? Welcome back to an all-new edition of the Fight Strength Podcast. I am, of course, Jason Burgos, contributor for both MMA Sucker and SureDog.com. And as always, I am joined by the strength and conditioning navigator, plotting seminar courses all over the place. That is, of course, when he is not working with the Stars of American Top Team. And that is my main man, Phil DeRue. Phil, what is up? Uh, what's going on, y'all? I am, I am kind of tired, but like I said, it, it's later on at night, so we're I'm, I'm trying to keep quiet a little bit. I got the kids sleeping, <laughs> but we're doing good. I'm glad we did this Q and A because I got a lot of things I want to air out, oh. and I got a lot of things I want to talk about. So we're we're gonna, we're gonna have fun. All right. Well, uh, on this week's edition of the show, we are going with a total ass Daru episode to give our very loyal listeners a chance to ask Phil questions. Even I have a couple of questions from listeners um, and some questions they just need answers to. Now, I can't forget to mention that you can listen to previous episodes just like this one or shows with guests like Tyra Woodley, Elias Theodoro, Colby Covington, Dustin Poirier, Tisha Torres by finding our pages on iTunes, Spotify, Player FM, iHeartRadio. Radio, SoundCloud, and of course on YouTube. Please share, comment, leave us a rating. You know, on those streaming service, let let us know what you think of the show. Um, also, if you're interested in sponsoring the show, you can find a bunch of pertinent information on our Facebook page, and you can contact contact us there or via our email address, which is fightstrengthpodcast at gmail. I mean, before we get into ask the ask the root questions, I mean, what's going on? I mean, I know you had the seminar with former guest PJ Nestler and Dan Garner a couple of weeks ago. I mean, it's been a, a little bit of time before, since we recorded we had paulie filling you for you uh, a couple weeks ago and you know uh, what, what what happened how did the seminar go in the muscle farm out in california oh it went really well man um you know we had uh 40 plus attendees i think that we uh really got to showcase a lot of content and and got to meet a lot of new coaches and a lot of people out there in california it was really great muscle farm hq the new one in california is actually it's astonishing man like i get i got to meet uh meet matt brown for the first time which is cool we chopped it up a little bit about his time over at west side barbell and louis and all them and then uh, i got to meet you know the owners of muscle farm and i'm not going to tell you exactly what may happen in the future but let's just know that we're going to have a close relationship you know coming soon but i'm not going to let that air out just yet we still have some things to work out and uh but it's gonna be good, man. I'm 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 excited for the future, and uh, and like I said, the uh, teaming up with those guys was uh, was an honor and was actually pretty um, pretty cool to see exactly you know their methodologies and and especially with Dan with his nutrition and um, and the way he goes about with his assessments and blood work and things like that. So we we did our thing, man. It was it was really fun. We just did a um, we just did a Q and A for the um, for the VIP attendees there that, oh uh, vip all right excuse me yeah yeah you know sometimes sometimes it happens like that where you gotta have vip and bottles how does bottles. one become a vip you, you gotta you gotta pay a little extra first of all <laughs> how much extra and yeah, there's bottle service involved <laughs> <laughs> all right who's handling yeah. that is, is, is pj or dan handling bottle service uh, none of them. I am. Uh, <laughs> oh, I, I mean, I, if I had to choose between the three, I feel you're the the, the best looking. So that would be the preferred <laughs> thing. So when you have the person that does bottle service, you want the look. So you got to go with Phil Drew out of those three. No disrespect. I appreciate that. <laughs> I, well, I we were talking about that. I said, you know, you know, PJ thinks he's he's a he's a pretty boy. So he thinks okay. he's he has what it takes. But I said everybody loves the beard. So the beard and the tattoos, I got them all day. <laughs> now, now Dan, on the other hand, I give Dan a, I give Dan a pass because he's Canadian, you know, and um, I love my Canadians. You know what I'm saying? He's a super nice guy, so I can't get mad at him for that. But PJ, California boy, you know I got this in the bag, bro. Come on. <laughs> all right, so, I mean, what – now, you mentioned Dan was doing the, the nutritioning and that stuff like that. What uh, element of the seminar were you particularly focused on doing? 
Well, I did um, my my presentation was on program design, periodization schemes, and also auto regulatory um, uh, techniques that I use for all my fighters, and then also a little bit of auto coaching just to learn, you know, how to actually properly understand your your athlete, your fighter, you know, how go how to go about coaching them from from uh, the art of coaching perspective, and and there is a there is a science behind the art of coaching, and and I just you know just uh, recently I'm gonna go ahead and plug his book, man, because I because I. Uh, I truly enjoyed it. It was Conscious Coaching by uh, Brett Bartholomew. And I think that every young coach and, you know, every uh, experienced coach should, should definitely pick up this book, pick up the audio book, whatever the case may be, and, uh, and give it a listen or give it a read because it is uh, something that, that every coach should actually uh, take, a, take into account. But uh, but yeah, that's what I, that's what I did for the, as far as the presentation goes. And then uh, I have another one coming up in a – uh, a couple weeks, actually on the 19th at my own private facility. So I'll be talking a little bit more about um, periodization schemes and then also um, exercise uh, transferability, also a couple of sp uh, special special exercises that I use to help uh, get the most out of my athletes and, and, and um, as far as that goes. And then we also going to bring up Nick for the cognitive uh, conditioning aspect of oh, it. Oh, cool. Yeah, so he's going to be doing a, a couple of presentations there, and then people are going to be able to interact on the games and things like that that we do with the fighters and how we collaborate um, from that perspective. And uh, we've been doing a lot of a lot of good things from an active recovery standpoint, um, especially in between sets of, of high intensity intervals or high intensity sets, um, just to get you know get them get them doing something, get their get their mind working even in between high amounts of energy outputs so we've seen tremendous increases in in overall performance along with their cognitive abilities so it's 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 pretty exciting and uh we're looking to e eventually we got to we got to test out the waters a little bit more but eventually working on an ebook between me and him so that should be fun all right well, i mean speaking ebook let's just throw it out there real quick uh uh Weight Cut, Systematic Strategies by you and Tony Ricci is still out there, still available for mm -hmm. anybody interested in DrewStrong.com. I mean, it's, it's as a person that helped to edit it, one of the coolest things I've ever worked on and just a great source of knowledge on how to weight cut professionally, safely, so you, you can get to weigh in day and to the fight as healthy and strong as you can as a fighter as even bjj practitioner for tournaments any kind of stuff like that i mean fantastic book um i know you recently did a discount sale do you think you'll do any anything else like that coming up soon any more discounts or any kind of uh percentages off for people interested in getting it yeah, I think I'll be doing it in the future here. Um, you know, as of right now, you know, we just ran that that one special, so probably do another one in in maybe a couple of weeks, and then uh, maybe an upsell with one of my programs. If you if you buy the ebook, you can get a free program um, that's in, that's that's going to be uh, increased the the value of the of the book if there can any be any more increase of the value of that ebook mm -hmm. but but you know giving you as much as we possibly can um to uh to enhance the, the your abilities as a coach to enhance your abilities um to perform better as an athlete whatever the case may be yeah and if you want any more information on it you can go listen to episode 25 i believe of the podcast we're co-author with uh phil tony ricci's on the show they both dabble and talk about the book you can watch the video version which is on youtube and our facebook page in the video section where you can see sections of the book get a little read little parts of it see what it looks like inside it's really great fascinating stuff i mean let's go right into the first ask the root question which is from at philip to mccormick on twitter he asks you phil how about hypertrophy and deadlifts with sauna use is there a good time to use the sauna and are you familiar with this information um as far as your hypertrophy uh, muscle building any type of any type of you know um hypertrophic gains that you're going to attain, attain through deadlifts it's because you're recruiting the most motor units and muscle fibers in that one particular lift it's a compound lift you a lot of muscles to get that weight up off the off the uh, floor um with sauna use i'm i'm not too familiar with as far as like maybe doing a deadlift and going into the sauna i do understand hypothermic conditioning made popularized by uh, dr Rhonda patrick uh, you know she discusses how you know how the conditioning of the body and heat stress um 
can induce you know plasma volume and blood flow to the heart and into the muscle um, with also increases of testosterone and uh, growth hormone release so that does work I'm not gonna lie I've seen the studies I like it um, I you I have my athletes do that um, post strength work so instead of having them you know go and sit in an ice bath where we are evidently going to be um, decreasing inflammation this is what we do not want to do at that point in time because we want to we want to make sure that we are getting that solid inflammation to get an adaptation um, to that stimulus. So what I'll have them do instead is to bring their body back down to parasympathetic, to go into the sauna, get that get all those benefits that you get from that hypothermic conditioning that Rhonda Patrick has talked about in the past and on Joe Rogan and on plenty other podcasts. And if you check on YouTube, you can you can find that too. Um, but mainly is to make sure that they're not going and doing another modality or another methodology or in, in all essence, they're not going and running five miles after they go do my strength work because you're, you're trying to pull the organism in two different directions at the same time and your body doesn't know what it's trying to accomplish at that point. So what I have them do is just so we can negate that, that, um, that whole process is to put them in a sauna for about 10 to 20 minutes, get all those benefits from the hypothermic conditioning, and then they can in jumpstart the recovery process because they're in a in a non cortisol state which is a parasympathetic state that makes sense yeah i mean uh, one question because you you know talking about this and i always wanted to ask you um why is it and you may be answered on a level two when you're recovering like that automatic jumping into like a, a ice bath or you know the, the the machines they have for there what does it do to the body after like a a workout that it's better to do that than say just a regular slow down cool off stretch and you know kind of end of the workout well why what's so beneficial that automatic jump into cold I mean, all those, all those are, are pretty beneficial, obviously, just cool down, just walking, getting the body temperature down as much as you possibly can. Um, but you, as far as means of um, anti-inflammation, mm -hmm. we want to maintain inflammation depending on what we're trying to accomplish with the strength training, with hypertrophy training. When you're trying to attain a certain stimulus, you do not want to shunt that stimulus or stop that adaptation by you know, anti-inflammatories like an ibuprofen or, or an ice bath or something like that. Studies have shown that it'll actually shunt or stop hmm. the, uh, the the production or the progression of strength. Hmm. So that's why I, I try to stay my guys and girls away from that at that point in time. Now, if they're doing a conditioning session or they're doing or they're sparring or they're doing hard grappling, you know, where where you know it's predominantly aerobic, then, then yeah, uh, ice bath would be sufficient. Um, but as far as trying to gain a strength adaptation or muscle gain, it actually stops the production of hypertrophy. If you mm -hmm. go into an ice bath or you do some type of anti-inflammatories, that's another reason why I don't like my guys doing or taking um, in any type of anti-inflammatory foods. Mm -hmm. And it's a small detailed approach, but if you if you ask any nutritionist, if you ask Tony Ricci, if you ask Dan Garner, if you ask Chris Algieri, if you ask you know uh, George Lockhart, whoever the guys may be, you don't want them to have high anti-inflammatory foods if you're trying to build strength and hypertrophy right after the workout. Oh, all right, interesting. Now, uh, next question from Dude Blaine on Twitter. He asks you, Phil, in a three-day full-body workout program, which workout should should be there each day, and what rep range should I be going for? Well, that just depends on what you're trying to accomplish. It also depends on where you're at in your program. Now, if you don't have a plan, you plan to fail. I say this all the time. That's why I do a lot of presentations on periodization. That's a good saying. You should make a shirt out of that. Nah, it's, it's already been taken. I'm not going to do that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I think I think four people took it, so I'm just I'm just piggybacking right now. <laughs> <laughs> but but you know, as far as that goes, I think that you know you also have to have a plan, like I said, and and there has to be a schedule for what you're trying to accomplish. You know, that training day and that training cycle. So, um, but as far as the three day split. You know, for you being limited, you, you know, the only way you're going to make gains is through high volume, high frequency. So if you're only in there for three days a week, we have to get a, as much volume to get a stimulus adaptation, whether it be hypertrophy, strength, explosive power, endurance, whatever the case may be. You have to do it as much times as possible so that your body can adapt and and uh, get a super compensation effect and whatever have you. So um, full body, you know, upper, lower. I like to go off of uh, um, an upper body push, an upper body pull, some sort of squat, a hip hinge, 
some sort of core activation. So that, whether that be anti-rotation, like a plank, or maybe even just like a an ab rollout. I love the I love ab rollouts. As far as from a carry perspective, something like a farmer's walk or a suitcase carry, that's going to activate a, a bunch of things. Not only with your core activation, but also from grip strength and a little bit of endurance. Um, so. I do that um, primarily with all my fighters, but also with my general public. So they're they're all, all getting what they need every time they walk into the gym. And um, from a three day split, it's hard to you know break up in quadrants um, and actually gain a solid stimulus because you're not training it enough. That makes sense. Yeah. I mean, yeah, so. when you say stuff, it always makes sense. But I know, appreciate that. You got it. It's, it's it's almost it's almost like a habit. You know, and somebody's like, yeah, if I go off on a tangent, sometimes I, I splurt over things. So mm -hmm. when I start going fast because I'm passionate about it, mm -hmm. so I try to slow it down and be like, does that make sense? Because I might have skipped a couple words. No, nah, I mean, and plus if you, you know, stretch it out to other areas, hey, you're just giving the listener even more information. And I'm sure you listeners appreciate that, right? Right. Yeah, well, well, let me get back to that one too because mm -hmm. with my three-day split, like you got to make sure that you're maximizing your 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 time. You know, especially if you have limited time in the gym, and if you're if you're working, you know, a nine-to-five, or if you're an elite athlete that that only has limited time to do strength and conditioning or whatever the case may be. I don't know. I don't know what this person um, does for a living, but you know, for me, I want to maximize my time in the gym. So I'm gonna actually get what I need to get done, and and I'm gonna do it with the um with the ability to to uh, maximize every muscle group in my body um so i can get that full frequency and that full volume to cause that stimulus adaptation all right fair enough now our next question is from someone you're familiar with uh, the creepy weasel on instagram att fighter steve montgomery now this question is actually for me he asked me uh since the ufc's deal with fox mma as a whole has exploded into the mainstream uh what difference if any have you noticed on the journalism side of things have more sports journalists joined in on the scene has the quality of journalism and mma gotten better or worse in your opinion um i mean first of all i would say that UFC was starting to grow even before it had hit Fox, you know, because of Spike and those those networks. It, it was even bigger, but um, yeah, there definitely is a, a difference. I feel like for sure, without a doubt, because of you know things, uh, the growth of the UFC, the journalism side has definitely grown a lot. And man, you have a lot more websites that are covering it. You know, you already had guys like back in the day, Kevin Ioli and Yahoo, but you have so many sports uh, sites now that get millions of views a, a month or weeks or whatever, like MMA Fighting, MMA Junkie, Bloody Elbow, Shirt Dog, you know, so it's definitely grown for even a guy like me and many other writers who are not necessarily maybe making money a lot of money or whatever but they can get out there and write you know this 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 it's harder to i think that's what's it's such more great about ma it's much more approachable so there's much more an outlet to get in there get your stuff out there and be taken a little bit more seriously where you have other sports have existed longer have wider bigger nets of information so it's definitely change uh, it's definitely more, more coverage for sure a lot more attention on ma all over the world all different sites it's, it, that's a tough thing about even starting ma sites now because there's so many of them now um has the quality of journalism and ma gotten better or worse uh it's a tough thing because now you have so many more sites that you are having people that are working on these sites and not necessarily you know on a payroll on a budget because the journalism industry is so difficult to make money in any way so you're going to have situations where maybe not the most qualified or overly qualified individuals are writing you know as a person that edited for sites you know you're going to get some so-so content but without a doubt there's so much more guys that got into the sport like myself like 10 15 you know years ago or more that they're passionate about it so you have a lot more people than just six seven years ago there's like a few writers that you know about now you have a lot of people that are very talented passionate longtime fans of the sport that truly love it truly have a smart opinion and understanding of it so i think journalism and has definitely got it better there's some drawbacks just like there is on any uh, journalism site and source you know you got the sites that want to cover the cat video to get views and you got that kind of stuff in ma too i mean you you got people looking for you know exploiting and 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 those kind of things but for sure it's gotten better 
it's grown, it's getting better, it's coming along. There's a lot of talented people out there, and they're not even on the main sites, but there's definitely a lot of good stuff out there. But uh, moving on, another person we're familiar with, James from the JB Podcast. What up, James? How you doing? Uh, he asked you, Phil, why is sleep important for an athlete who is strength training and wants mm -hmm. to see muscular growth as well as a gain in weight on their lifts? Yeah, so I mean, when you're sleeping, you're in a parasympathetic state. So basically what you're doing is you're decreasing the cortisol, you're decreasing stress in all actuality. So we're trying to recover to train the next day as hard as possible. If we don't do that, we, we allow um, sleep deprivation or whatever the, the case may be. Um, like you see with um, a lot of the guys that go into buds with um, – with the Navy SEALs, they sleep deprive them and then they actually have them do physical and mental testing. So what you're trying to accomplish there is you're trying to see how well they can actually perform while they're sleep deprived. And it's not, it's, it's, let's just say it's not that optimal, you know, um, <laughs> uh, you know, at, at the end of the day, they've done numerous studies on sleep and sleep deprivation. And then also the, um, the importance of sleep in uh, strength training and all, in, in all gentleness, I think that if you don't get at least, you know, eight, maybe even sometimes nine, depending on the athlete and depending on the age of the athlete, um, you're going to see declines in performance in your overall acuity and also um, and also see a, a, an increase in your uh, ability to fatigue and an increase in the rate of, uh, of injury. So it is a big deal. Um, I, I personally prefer you get eight to nine hours of sleep if you're a high level athlete, especially if you're a pro athlete. And even for, you know, depending on how, um, how active you are in your daily living, you know, six, seven, and maybe even eight hours of sleep would be good for the average person. So, you know, hope that that makes a, that makes a, makes it, makes it helpful for people to understand. But, you know, at the same time, I don't get a lot of sleep, so I can't really talk, you know, um, I try to, don't get me wrong, but at the same time, I have three businesses going on. I have kids, but you just got to find that time to actually either lay down at night or at least find a way to, to get a little bit extra sleep in the morning. Now, you know, gurus and success gurus will tell you to get up at 3 a.m. And, and I, and, and listen, man, when I was grinding, when I, when I was, um, when I was on the come up, as you would say, you know, <laughs> I would get up every morning, you know, I'd get up every morning at 3.30 and I would train and do my thing. And I was also 21 years old and I could have mm -hmm. probably, I could probably accomplish that pretty yep. well. Um, getting older, I think, I think uh, I'm going downhill after 29. I don't know. I can't do the things <laughs> I used to do. So sleep is, is a very important part to, um, to your overall performance in everyday living and not to mention in your, in your physical performance. So, yeah. And, you know, sleep avoids crankiness. And speaking from experience, I've encountered cranky Phil DeRue, and it's not good. It's not pretty, <laughs> folks. It's not good. But, I mean, like, you know, those people that, that get such little sleep, they're just outliers. Yeah, you hear stories about certain people that can have these crazy sleep schedules and they don't get much and they still seem to get so much done. They're, they're not the normal person. Like, I, I think of, like, sleep as in, like, you put your cell phone charge, your phone on charge, and you see the battery going up. Like, that's your, like, sleep is making you charge up for another day in front of you. Like, it's recovering your body, and it's doing all these things. Like, it has to happen. Or, you know, it's like maintenance. It's like taking your car into the, the shop. It's like your body needs that kind of maintenance. So, if you don't get it, you just, you're just screwing yourself over. And it's just, it's also mentioned, speaking of, like, you know, the ebook we mentioned before. You, you guys talk about it in the book, how that's just a, a big part of recovery. And the training yeah. you have to get sleep it just it's just taking care of your body and even napping which is my favorite part that's in the book because yeah. you know as a high level athlete myself i too like to nap you know i'm a high level podcaster so you got to get naps in there but <laughs> <laughs> moving on from there uh at dirty mako fascinating name on instagram asks you phil in your opinion what is the best way to build a sufficient aerobic base for fighters yeah so I've talked about this numerous times, especially with my with my programming, is that um, in the beginning, before you start camp, you also you definitely want to develop a solid aerobic base, a solid VO2 max, um, to try to get that resting heart rate as, as as low as possible, and to get your heart rate reserved with the biggest amount um, of um, of uh, of gapping. So, for me, I like to do long slow distance running. 
um, depending on the person, obviously. It depends on if they're heavyweight, if they're a little bit older. Um, but for fighters in general, they love to run anyway, so it's not a big deal for them. Uh, so I have them run, you know, 30 to 45 minutes, keeping the heart rate around 120, 140, no more than 145, 150. And um, so they can maintain a, a solid conversation and uh, the intensity is not so high that they can do that long duration. And what that does is just kind of, it opens up blood capillaries, it opens up their lungs in general. It teaches them how to breathe efficiently. Um, and then also you're recruiting a lot of slow twitch muscle fibers to help with the endurance factor of the of the fight game. Um, once that happens, then it goes in to uh, once you go into camp, then you're going to be working more anaerobic conditioning because you you set the baseline with the aerobic base for um, being able to do more bouts of high intense energies or energy outputs um, for a longer duration. So once we get into camp, then we're going to be primarily working on anaerobic and um, and. That would be something like a high intensity interval, something like a sprint interval that's going to last no more than 10 to 12 seconds, um, utilizing ATP and, and creatine phosphate as your main energy source because anaerobic does mean without oxygen. So we want to make sure we're maximizing that as much as we can with a time frame that's going to match um, what we do in the weight room because we remember what I said before, I don't want to throw the organism in two different directions. So if I'm doing strength exercises that and I usually go off a of time base and a lot of a lot of the stuff I get is from triphasic training and Cal Dietz, but he talks about, you know, time based training where um, the method is that whatever you do as far as your, your weights go, as far as like let's say you're doing a heavy back squat and let's say it takes you no longer than around six to ten seconds, then your running or your aerobic work should last around six to ten seconds. So you're not going to uh, create a, a, uh, a misunderstanding or confusion in your body. Um, so when you're trying to train for strength and you're trying to train for, for explosive speed and, and um, endurance in that aspect, you want to train it simultaneously or at least around the same time frame of the phase that you're training. And then from there, um, you also want to develop lactic or glycolytic conditioning, something around the long, along the lines of some type of circuit training or just in general, hard grappling work, you know, something that they're doing sports specifics. I usually like doing that more than anything because it just puts them in the right frame of mind and it also helps them um, uh, from, a, from, a, from a fighter's perspective how to actually um, cope with the stresses put upon them in a, in a um, skilled or sports specific realm. So, um, but as far as building that aerobic base, I definitely like to do it at least 16 to 12 weeks out from the fight and then kind of sprinkle that in, you know, every once in a while, maybe once or twice a week, depending on if they're fairly fast or slow twitch dominant. If they're fast twitch, we want to do it a little bit more consistently throughout the camp um, and do that on the off days of, of uh, strength training so you're not throwing that organism in two different directions, but you're still getting that adaptation and you're, con and you're maintaining that adaptation throughout the entire uh, fight camp because there is times where you are going to lose that. So we want to make sure that we are maintaining as much as we possibly can. Um, so aerobic, aerobic um, capacity usually lasts around, I want to say, roughly around six to eight weeks. So it's not like you're going to lose it at any time throughout the camp. Um, but it, it is something that you want to throw in, especially if you have a fast switch dominant fighter, you know, somebody who's highly explosive that lacks that ability to be aerobically sound or have that um, that ability to go for long duration. Um, and then and the same thing goes for, you know, a slow, you know, a slow twitch fiber guy or a guy that can go for long rounds, but doesn't really have that explosive power or that explosive um, bouts of energy. Um, so. With that, we, we throw in more anaerobic conditioning throughout that time frame because for that, you only have around 35 days um, before that starts to diminish. So we want to make sure we're, we're maintaining that adaptation throughout the entire camp. Uh, so we throw those in periodically, like I said, and building that aerobic base is the key. Um, a cool question on aerobic stuff and even anaerobic working out in a, in a camp because uh, it came to mind. I mean, just a question as a, a long time uh, 
fan of the sport. Um, things like high altitude training, you know, we've heard about places like Big Bear in boxing for pff, decades and whatever. We've even heard in MMA with guys like TRTs, and now you have this this growing burgeoning camp in Colorado with guys like TJ Jello Show and stuff. Um, what is your opinion on high altitude training? Is it a legit thing where it really can take aerobic work and anaerobic work and building of the lugs, strengthening lugs, and cardio work to another level? Or do you, do you think it's more myth? Because you see guys from uh, places not in the mountains that are fantastic as well. Um, I think you need to be there for a longer time than what people think. You know, um, okay. there, there there has been studies that show that you can maintain that um, that level of of oxygen uptake, of oxygen saturation, hemoglobin. Um, you know, the the content of oxygen in the blood basically, and um, what you can do from there is if you go to train or let's say you have a fight in a, in a high altitude area, let's say yep. just Colorado, yeah. whatever, whatever the mm -hmm. case may be, I would definitely go ahead and consider on training there your entire camp, if not half of your camp. So you can acclimate to the situation because your performance is going to, is going to dampen a little bit because you're not used to that altitude. Mm -hmm. So the, the air is thinner, especially for somebody or, you know, guys over here down in Florida at sea level, yeah. that's a, that's a whole different atmosphere. So, um, you want to make sure that you are, are acclimated to that, to that, uh, to that climate and to that situation. So, but yeah, it, it does raise EPO or erythropoietin, which, which helps with higher VO2 maxes. That's why uh, a lot of the guys go into hyperbaric chambers and things like that to help with that oxygen uptake, which in turn will help with a, a better solid aerobic capacity uh, so yeah if you're if you're looking to do that then I would say definitely uh, go there a little bit earlier and uh, get acclimated to the situation because you're you, in the first couple of weeks your performance is gonna lack just in general because it's just you're not used to that thin ass air so um, but it, it does help there has been studies that show that it does help and that's why you have hyperbaric chambers all over the place you know uh, you know uh, as far as like like um, I know cyclists do it a lot. I know long distance marathon runners do it a lot, you know, so it, it does have, have its advantages, um, but you have to put it in the right place at the right time. And you have to make sure that you're, um, that, that, the, that the circumstances are where they need to be. So that's why, I mean, that's pretty much why the Olympic Training Center is in Colorado mm -hmm. for the, for the most part. Yeah, I mean, and it may, you, you, I think you said it best perfectly to start with it. It's just something that you have to be there all the time or you're not really getting the most out of it because perfect example, it, it almost feels like that unique, uh, like, advantage or element that can be added to MMA that is very unusual because like you see in other sports like football whatever you have rain or soccer you have rain you can change the game snow and a perfect example is in the, the fight between Verdum Fabricio Verdum and Cain Velasquez when they fought for the world title in Mexico City which is in the mountains high super high altitude and mm -hmm. Uh, Kane Velasquez, who is a crazy cardio machine, he's coming from California near the ocean, low, a bit of a lower altitude. He only came into Mexico City, I think, like a week before, while Verdum, I think, was there almost two months before. And then by mid-round two, the cardio machine started to tire, and Verdum won it. And yeah. it's almost like an, a cool ele cool element adds to the fight, because I think on that same card, you had guys like Gilbert Melendez and Diego Sanchez. I think, no, D uh, Gilbert Melendez and somebody else, I forgot who it was. Um, mm -hmm. And they were, oh, Eddie Alvarez. And they're very good cardio guys. They went into that kind of climate, I mean, and altitude, and their cardio was terrible. And they had, like, yep. a ugly, sluggish fight. So, um, yeah, that's, I mean, great points by you. I, I, it really informed me on that one. I always wondered about it. But let's move on to the next question. We have two left. Uh, at Molinari on Instagram asks me, uh, Bellator seems to be going on, going for a lot of high-level BJJ guys. And the last card was loaded with subs. Uh, what, yeah, Bellator 190 had all submissions the entire card except mm. for the main event uh seems bjj service is a better base possibly in bellator than in the ufc is that a roster caliber thing or more than that uh, i think it's it's a result of just how scott coker does his matchmaking because he does have there are a ton of high level bjj guys and they were really showcased in the last card but if you follow scott coker and when he ran strike force because he has a limited roster he doesn't have the same level of talent a uh, ufc does what helps his kind of brand and his promotion is finishers and that's what he was good at matchmaking to get finishes in strike force and same thing in bellator to get finishes and uh it's in bjj you have guys that are coming from a base that is built more for 
getting submissions and getting finishes early on. That's where they're coming from, where you have a lot of high level wrestlers that they are bringing into Bellator, like uh, Ed Ruth and uh, and the Fortune Brothers and Aaron Pico, who, yeah, they can get you down, but they're not necessarily finishers. They have to really be taught into ground and pound. So I think that's just a part of Bellator. And, and, and yeah, it probably is the roster because maybe the caliber of guys aren't as high. So there's not as much as, as high level wrestlers that can maybe counteract it or the BJJ guys. So you have a... a, a, a imbalance between two so strong bjj guys get finishes and seem better and maybe go to bell and ufc and they'll do the same but i think it's part roster part matchmaking and just part trying to sell good fights would you agree with that do you think that's the the thing about bjj guys and bellator yeah i mean uh, there's a lot of talent out there and people just don't understand that it's, it's not just the ufc you know uh, and you got a lot of talented bjj guys that that could definitely make make a huge mark in ufc but you know bellator i think just like you said the matchmaking is is on point to where you're going to see a lot of high level submissions and and it's going to be frequent but it, it definitely just depends on you know the organization and how they want to go ahead and, and center their their performances around um but I don't know. It is coincidental, but it's a good it's a good assumption and it's a good uh, breakdown, though, Jason. Oh, thank you, thank you. Now on to the last question again from someone we're familiar with. Very nice guy, Neil Banegas Saibe. I hope he he has you, Neil. You gotta tell me, man. Text me if I'm saying your name right. Is it Saibe Saibe? <laughs> let let me know. Let me know, please. <laughs> but uh, he asked on Facebook. He asked you, Phil. Is there ever a time in a camp where you would keep a fighter from lifting weights altogether? Yeah. On the flip side, is there ever a time when you would keep a fighter from doing any kind of hard conditioning? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's both uh, both questions, I guess. Yes, but it's it's uh, you have to figure out from an assessment standpoint where they're at, what they've done, um, where they want to go, and uh, what their strengths are and what their weaknesses are. So. At the same time, I know that they're getting a shit ton of aerobic work inside their skill-specific training. So um, I, I primarily lean towards more of the um, not hard conditioning side because they're just getting a shit ton of that in their skills and tactical training. Um, but there are some times where I have some monsters that are just strong as shit and they don't have to get any stronger. We just got to maintain and increase their explosive power. So it really just depends on the individual. And um, and at, at some points in time, I may just even not, not totally – um, get rid of the strength work or totally get rid of the aerobic work, but we just minimize it depending on the person and depending on their strengths and weaknesses and what they want to accomplish um, in the fight. Uh, like a guy like, uh, you know, Dustin Poirier, who has tremendous, has a tremendous gas tank. Um, his aerobic capabilities are, are tremendous. Um, my, my focus and my goal was to get him stronger and more explosively powerful throughout all rounds of the fight. And as we see, it can be accomplished if you do it the right way. Um, if you look at Dustin's last fight, you know, it was it was a hard, hard fight. But, you know, at the later rounds, we ended up getting that knockout because he had the ability to be explosive even through the later rounds, which that also can attribute to his high aerobic base. If you have an aerobic base, you're able to, you know, um, create enough enough energy, right, mm -hmm. throughout the entire time to uh to create that in high intensity bout of uh of uh, explosive power or whatever the whatever the case may be so yeah it really just depends on the person and and your your assessment and how you assess the athlete and what they want to accomplish and and what their strengths are is a key, key factor in in your programming and your auto regulation techniques so that that hope that answers the question <laughs> All right, that's our last question. I mean, thank you, everybody, that sent us questions. Please always feel free to contact us via our Facebook page, you know, the Fight Strength Podcast, or on Twitter, Fight Strength underscore, or on an email, Fight Strength Podcast at Gmail. You can DM Phil. You can DM me on Instagram, wherever. Let us know if you ever have questions. Send it whenever, because if we don't get to it that week, we will save it, and we will ask it the next time. Um, Phil, as always, give them your social media, and let them know any other things they should be on the lookout for before we go. Okay, so yeah, social media. Instagram is at Daru Strong. Have plenty of videos there. Uh, Twitter is at Daru Strong. Also, be on the lookout for my brand new fight ready program for overtime athletes coming out soon. We're coming out by the end of the month, so be on the lookout with that with me and Chris Barner. And then also, um, what's still out now, Fight Strength for uh, or Fight Strong six month program that's that's with fight strength uh fight camp conditioning.com mm. you can check that out on their website which is selling like crazy everybody's loving it so i'm really excited about that 
and to see, you know, new progression and, and, and new outcomes from, from that program. So it's all good. And then obviously our ebook, Weight Cut Systematic Strategies, on my website. You can check it out there. Check out, you know, what it has to offer and why we decided to write this book, Meet Tony Ricci, and then edited by yours truly, Jason Burgos. Oh, yeah. I mean, well, also, the, the social Daru Strong on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook, not on Snapchat. Not on Snapchat, no. <laughs> <laughs> All right, for me, uh, Jericho Bennett on Instagram, Cheap Seats Chat on Twitter. As always, you can listen to the show on Spotify, iTunes, iHeartRadio, Google Play, SoundCloud, Player FM, Podcast, whatever or not. It's all over the place. This is episode. I didn't. I forget the episode now. Let me look Man. it up. <laughs> oh yeah, thirty-seven episode thirty-seven of the Fight Strain Podcast. I am Jason Burgos. He is Phil DeRue. Until then, bye-bye.